Uh, my name is Jim Hurl, and I have the honor of serving as NCAR director. I've been in this position for about two years, but I've actually been at NCAR since coming here as a postdoctoral scientist back in 1990. So I'm going to have an opportunity in the morning to say a little bit more about NCAR, where we are, where we're going, and the very important role that HAO plays in NCAR uh, moving forward. And I'll have that opportunity uh, tomorrow morning. Right now, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this very special event this afternoon, which is, of course, to honor Dr. Bruce Leitz and to congratulate him on his appointment as an NCAR Distinguished Scholar. Uh, there are only three NCAR Distinguished Scholars currently, um, Guy Bersour, Rick Anthes, and now Bruce. Um, this appointment was established in 2011, and it really is meant to recognize exceptional careers that have been marked by research and service in the atmospheric and related sciences that is really internationally recognized as being of the highest quality with extraordinary influence. And I think for all of you in attendance today, celebrating this wonderful three days of celebration of HAO's past, present, and future, I think you can all agree that these are characteristics of Bruce and his exceptional scientific career. This recognition is actually the highest honor that can be bestowed on a NCAR scientist who is either retired or is in a phased retirement. And it is a four-year renewable term, along with some non-salary funding, to facilitate the individual's desire to continue to conduct research and very importantly, continue to collaborate and mentor uh, early career scientists. So just now, uh, a bit about Bruce. Bruce was appointed a scientist at NCAR in 1984. He became a senior scientist at NCAR in 1989, and he continued in that role until his retirement. And then we had the pleasure of putting him forward as a senior scientist emeritus in 2013. And so he is an NCAR senior scientist emeritus approved by the UCAR Board of Trustees in 2013. During his NCAR tenure, he has been and he continues to be a scientific leader in the area of solar spectral polarimetry. And for Alice, if Alice is in the audience, struggling with that this morning. I was so glad to hear that because I always have to concentrate. I'm a climate guy, so spectral polarimetry is something that I have to practice. But uh, Bruce is absolutely a scientific leader, uh, both within NCAR and within the broader community. And there are many examples of his leadership and his accomplishments, and I'm not going to take the time to go into those in detail here today. But for example, through his national and international engagement as PI of the Solar Optical Telescope Spectropolarimeter on board the Japanese-American Hanoide Space Mission, his laudable service in many regards to the solar physics community, through his mentoring, as I mentioned, of young scientists who have gone on to be leaders in the field in their own right, and through his research productivity, as evidenced by, if you look at a CV, nearly, I think, 170 peer-reviewed publications, an H index, if you follow those kind of metrics, well into the 50s, and a nearly equal number of non-referee papers, Bruce has established his preeminence in spectral polarimetry, as well as certainly enhanced NCAR's reputation in that field of work as well. And because of this exceptional track record in both research and community service, I also wish to mention that in 2010, Bruce received the UCAR Distinguished Achievement Award, which is also very prestigious. It's the highest honor that UCAR gives out, and Bruce is uh, only one of eight recipients of that award. He is concerned with the problem of measuring magnetic fields on the sun throughout his NCAR career. And as this list of awards would indicate, he has contributed enormously to all aspects of this science. Bruce made the original interpretation of spectropolarimetric data, leading to breakthrough 
insights on the structure and magnetic topology of the sun's photosphere. He helped tackle the difficult problem of calibration of instrumental polarization effects, and he has led the design of cutting edge spectral polarimetric instrumentation. From the theoretical investigation of polarized line formation and magnetized media, to the development of numerical inversion tools for the inference of vector magnetic fields from observations, Bruce's work truly has set a standard in the field that is looked upon as a definitive reference. So it is my pleasure and my distinct honor as NCAR director in consideration of Bruce's remarkable career, his many achievements, his service to the community, as well as the role that he has played within our organization here at NCAR, as well as his strong desire to remain involved in the research and continue his mentorship activities, to name Bruce as an NCAR distinguished scholar. So please join me in congratulating Bruce on this real honor. Thank you so much, Jim. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jim. It's been uh, an amazing experience today for me to look around and see all these familiar faces, and it's a humbling experience to not only to uh, revisit um, what went on before uh, I essentially arrived at, at HAO, but also to recognize that, um, I mean, all this is, I hear my name spoken and so forth, but really it's a lot of the people actually are here in this room and some of them who are not, who really made a lot of what I'm going to talk about today possible. So, um, to begin, um, I'm going to give a kind of a, a, a personal um, um, uh, view as many have done today of the um, of, of my sort of uh, my journey through uh, developing polarimetry at at, uh, at uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research for studying the sun and um, uh, first of all uh, I would like to um, just uh, do a, a quick overview uh, in, in summary of why we observe uh, magnetic fields on the sun why we want to uh, here's one justification. Uh, the nation that controls magnetism will control the universe, and I, I don't think that's very much in keeping with the International Geophysical Year. You were heard about this morning. Uh, that, that's uh, a quote that uh, we uh, was looking for, and I couldn't find the actual cartoon from it. Um, another one is, um, if you go back to Andy's talk this morning and the question about stellar astronomers, this is a Another quote that has been floating around for a lot of years, if the sun didn't have a magnetic field, then it would be as boring a star as most astronomers think it is. So, uh, um, uh, well, I, Dr. Dr. Noyes at, at Harvard is, is one of those uh, who actually uh, did bridge the gap in the early days between stellar and, and solar uh, physics. Um, but in actuality, we've heard a lot today, and I don't need to dwell on this, but this is, is a, 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 the real justifications. This is a magnetogram movie taken with the SOHO uh, MDI instrument. And this is in the, during the epoch of around 2003 Halloween, uh, the Halloween flares of that period. Uh, these movies are not in sync. This is a, I believe, a Lasco C2, if somebody knows. Um, uh, coronal imager showing the development of the corona during this, this epoch. And uh, this is a time when there were um, um, a, a couple of extremely large naked eye sunspots visible on the disk and producing a lot of flares. And as you can see, a lot of coronal mass ejections. And when it produces flares, you see a cloud of, of particulate um, uh, interference with the, with the observations. Um, <clears throat> And you've seen modeling, of course, uh, when, when uh, the disturbances from the coronal mass ejections come to the magnetosphere, they cause uh, geomagnetic disturbances and aurorae, as we've, as we've seen. And so um, we look at the uh, evolution of the sun during the solar cycle. And again, this is a magnetogram. 
And these magnetogram images, so negative magnetic polarity is, is black and positive is white on the background. You can see that this shows most of the solar cycle and see how the sun at solar minimum near where we are now are approaching it. It's fairly bald, but then there's a lot of activity uh, closer to maxima and you have the, the uh, 11 year sunspot cycle, occurrence of sunspots. Then that uh, is also accompanied at the time of many sunspots, uh, which individually darken the atmosphere, um, uh, causing a, a small uh, uh, increase in the irradiance, uh, total energy output of the sun, only about a tenth of a percent or so. Um, so there are, are definite uh, solar influences that everybody's interested in, in, um, in, in uh, understanding. And these are short-term impulsive uh, influences. And then uh, longer-term ones, the variations in solar wind, and in particular the topology in inter interplanetary magnetic field, uh, variations in the total solar irradiance, which must affect the climate system on Earth to some degree. And of course, the changes in the ultraviolet solar irradiance as well, which affects the upper atmosphere uh, greatly. And we need to understand um, what's happening in the sun in order to understand the whole system. So all these um, uh, various topics of, of what's happening on the sun lead to these effects that affect the Earth. So that's where we, we begin. Um, well, how do we measure magnetic fields on the sun? We don't actually measure them when we sense them remotely because we ha can't put a magnetometer directly in the solar atmosphere. <clears throat> the answer is, most commonly, with polarization, although there are other means of doing it, with, um, of, of making um, of remote sensing magnetic fields, the most common one is with polarization. And one can use uh, several um, effects, including the Hanley effect and scattering polarization, but the dominantly uh, what we concern ourselves with is the Zeeman effect. And I'll be talking about that in a moment. But first, Andy Skamanich this morning uh, mentioned a few words about what we, what we, how we actually describe polarization. I want to give a little more uh, heuristic or observational definition where if we take a linear polarizer, for example, and then a couple of circular polarization analyzers, and with those, we can uh, define how we define the Stokes vectors. And these are essential quantities that I'm going to be showing observations throughout this talk um, that, that deal with these quantities. So uh, I wanted to point out what they are. So for, for example, if you take your linear polarizer and you orient it so it passes electric vectors horizontally, then, uh, and then you rotate it by 90 degrees, and you sum those up, you get the total intensity or the total energy of what you're observing. Um, if you want to look at the state of linear polarization, if you take the difference between the horizontal and vertical orientations, you get what's known as Stokes Q. If you rotate those polariz linear polarizer by 45 degrees and then subtract the 140, 135 degree orientation, you get um, Stokes U. And Stokes V is the difference between the left, uh, the right circular analyzer and the left circular analyzer. So bear those in mind, and uh, and then we look at. Uh, um, oftentimes we're dealing with absorption lines. We can also deal with emission lines as well, in measurements, but typically in absorption lines. So uh, we look, we consider an atomic system and how is this affected by a magnetic field? This is your what's known as a normal normal Zeeman triplet. And I'm going to be describing the, the Zeeman effect. What you have is um, uh, two atomic levels and a normal transition between them. In the absence of a magnetic field, you have a single spectral line that is formed, in, in the, for example, in the solar spectrum. In the presence of a magnetic field, there are uh, these levels. The, this level is, is degenerate and splits into three levels. One is unchanged in energy. The other two are split by an amount uh, that's proportional to the what's known as the Larmor frequency, which is the precession frequency of the magnetic moment about the direction of the magnetic field. And so, uh, because there are these, there are two states. One creates a, a slight bluer shift of the of the spectral of the of the spectral feature here, and a redwood shift. 
Uh, and so <clears throat> this will, can lead to a splitting of the, of the lines. Um, and now we consider the atom as an, uh, a classical oscillator. There, the theory has, of course, been developed in quantum mechanics, but it's uh, much more conceptually easy to, to consider this as, as a classical oscillator. And you can think of it as a three-axis oscillator you know, with springs and so forth. But in the <coughs> frame of a magnetic field where you have this large precession, it's, it's uh, more uh, precise to think of it as two uh, circular oscillators and one linear oscillator along the magnetic field. The circular oscillators are, are oscillating in opposite directions. So when, light, uh, transit, when a um, light is propagating in this direction towards an observer, um, the um, transverse electric fields interact with these circular oscillators and uh, you have absorption on the red side and on the blue side of the line. Uh, this is an intensity. And Stokes V then gives you this anti-symmetric uh, feature. Uh, this this uh, oscillator is along the direction of the propagation, so it's unaffected. When you have a transverse Zeeman effect, when the, line, the field is transverse to the line of sight, then this linear oscillator is, is affected. It's at the rest wavelength, and there's absorption from it here. The two circular oscillators are also excited, but they're seen edge on, and so what you see is absorption of linear polarization at those shifted wavelengths. And, and so the upshot is that uh, this anti-symmetric uh, circular polarization here and symmetric linear polarization signature that's symmetric about line center. <clears throat> okay, well this is uh, the solar spectrum from the violet to the infrared um, in the visible solar spectrum and uh, you can see all the multitude of lines and most of them are affected by the Zeeman effect uh, from magnetic fields in the sun. Um, we're going to concentrate on one particular uh, wavelength in the red and this is the one that's um, frequently used in many of the instruments we've, we've used. Two lines due to unionized iron are considered here. This one, at, these are around uh, 630 nanometers. They're accompanied by two uh, very narrow lines. These are absorption lines from oxygen, atomic oxygen, in the Earth's atmosphere. And, uh, but, but these are the magnetic, these are selected because they are magnetically sensitive, very highly magnetically sensitive, large splittings because of the Zeeman effect. This is a normal Zeeman triplet. And this is one that's a little bit less sensitive, but they're formed as in, in have similar formations. And so when you look at the, when, when you um, do what we call spectropolarimetry, that's taking the spectrum, this is wavelength, and in this case it's the intensity you see these absorption features and in intensity. And uh, you see the actual splitting of the line. This is in the umbra of a sunspot. You see the symmetric Stokes Q signature and likewise the Stokes U and the anti-symmetric Stokes V. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the, 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 the devil is in the details here in that extracting magnetic fields from these, we have to um, uh, understand exactly what these shapes are and be able to e extract the information of how these, these sh shapes of the polarization actually uh, um, affect that, um, that spectral signature in polarization. <coughs> so um, here is an example of some spectral polarimetry taken with the Van Stokes polarimeter. Again, you have um, uh, a solar image, and this is where we put our spectrograph slit. And along the slit, we have this is the intensity spectrum and wavelength of those two lines. We have images now of Q, U, and V uh, imaged here. And the the idea then is to take these this kind of data, these data here, and then from that, uh, uh, by scanning the spectrograph slit across the the, the solar image extract the, the magnetic field, not just its strength, but also its orientation. <clears throat> um, there are a number of ways to, to do that. Uh, one is, is uh, most commonly is, is, is with what's known as an inversion procedure. 
Um, and that's, they, it's called an inversion, but it's actually uh, essentially a least squares fitting procedure. Uh, the solar profiles are, are uh, then um, uh, attempted to mimic them with a, a model generated from a model of the atmosphere and the magnetic field structure in the solar atmosphere. Then there's a, a difference made, and a um, and and from the difference you get of, of the spectra, you get um, um, differences that from which you calculate um, uh, adjustments to the model parameters, and you recompute the synthetic profiles, iterate until you hopefully get a, uh, a convergence. And depending on how good your model is, um, uh, you can. Um, um, determine the field fairly precisely, we believe. <clears throat> Andy talked about some early magnetic field measurements at HAO, and indeed, uh, the Stokes-1 instrument produced very nice spectral pro profiles of a single line, Stokes profiles here. But um, for, for various reasons, this is what the, the magnetic field vector was inferred in the, in the, in the, in the sunspot. And it, was fairly, um, it, there, were, there were some uh, true issues. And so this is the point at which I came into this field of spectroporometry. I was working at the time at the National, well, it was the Sacramento Peak Observatory at that point in Sunspot, New Mexico, <clears throat> and not doing polarimetry. I was working on other things. And Grant Athe, my thesis advisor, who um, you've heard many times today and, and who recently passed away this year, um, he uh, contacted me and, and suggested that I might uh, try to look into um, including uh, magneto-optical effects into the inversion procedure that had been developed by Larry Auer, um, Heasley, and, and, and House. And uh, so I, I, that sounded very interesting to me, so I, I jumped at the opportunity to do that um, and uh, and, and started working on it and managed to do it, and, but we didn't get quite all the way. And I, then I started working with Andy uh, Skamanich on the problem, and we did some more modifications to the code, and finally came up with something that was then able to consistently give believable answers to the um, magnetic field parameters for, for sunspots observed with the Stokes II instrument. Well, that was... Um, was a, a really big impetus uh, uh, to, um, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say this is the magneto-optical reversal here. But there are other effects in Stokes Q and U that come from magneto-optics. <coughs> um, that was a big impetus for, for perhaps developing a new instrumentation. A lot of people were, were uh, well, we were very excited about the, the success of the analysis. And, and given the fact that, that there were the, the the data weren't optimal at that point. Uh, we th saw a lot of ways that we could improve the data in terms of spatial resolution and coverage and a and, and number of things. Uh, so there was a um, um, we we'd like to have better uh, resolution uh, approach a second of arc to start to res resolve some of the magnetic structures that we can clearly see in intensity and uh, and be able to. Um, um, map the uh, field consistently over whole active regions. Um, so uh, this was the impetus for uh, uh, actually which ultimately led to the, the advanced Stokes polarimeter developed uh, here at, at uh, HAO jointly with the National Solar Observatory and then on with the Hinode uh, spacecraft. Uh, there was a, a consort in the early 80s there was a con uh, a consortium, uh, of, uh, a very loose consortium, developed between uh, uh, these five institutions. Uh, of course, you know who was it was at HAO. I was at the National Solar Observatory, which was in Sac Peak. Um, <clears throat> Don Mickey was the primary person at the University of Hawaii. Um, David Reese at the University of Sydney, who did a lot of work on, on uh, theory of, of polarization transfer. And then uh, Gidio Landi, also in, in the atomic physics aspect, was at Arcetri in Italy. And so we started talking about how we wanted to build an instrument. Ideally, we wanted to build a new, uh, a brand new facility. Um, um, 
But then there were, there were, we wanted to figure out what kind of science targets. Uh, obviously, active region science, we wanted to do that, but there are a number of other things. Um, and then a big issue was how we would do the discrimination wavelength. We're going to use a spectrograph or a tunable filter. Um, so let me uh, just show you. This is with some Hinode data. This is uh, the, the data that you take, that you collect, is essentially a five-dimensional hypercube. Uh, you have um, X and Y, two dimensions, uh, spatial dimensions on the sun. You have wavelength um, uh, and, and to measure the, the, the polarization. You have four states of polarization, I, Q, U, and V, and then you have the time evolution. Well, of course, the, the polarization and the wavelength can be multiplexed in time. So in terms of the detection, uh, it would, you, you, you're left with a mere three dimensions, x, y, and lambda. But um, and in fact, there are three-dimensional uh, detectors. There's a type of film that, that can, uh, are, can do this, can discriminate wavelengths at the same time as it gets x, y, and information. Uh, and then some of you may be uh, familiar with, um, with um, um, what is it? Um, charge counting or, or photon counting detectors, which can do the same thing, um, uh, which can measure the energy of individual photons. But the, none of those are really applicable for a visible spectrum. So you're pretty much stuck uh, at that time with the state of the art with two-dimensional detectors. And so um, here is, is a, essentially observations of the sunspot. Um, I'm going to first talk about a spectrum in which you have a spectrograph slit along here in the y direction and you measure uh, in spectral uh, wavelength. And this is the intensity there. At each of the, um, each of the uh, uh, Stokes parameters are, are shown here. These are actual data. And IQ, U, and V, anti-symmetric V. And what you do then, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is you, you do this kind of measurement, get all IQ, U, and V, and then you step the spectrograph slit slightly along the, the x direction. And, and do the measurement over again. Um, a lot of people were in favor of, of imaging instruments, which also have their advantages. Imaging instruments take a slice. They get both x and y in spatial dimensions at one time, but using the filter, which tunes to one particular wavelength, as, as for example here. And so that wavelength, uh, this is what the intensity looks like at that particular wavelength. If you scan through. Um, Q, uh, linear polarization, the other linear polarization, and B, you see that. And then what you have to do is then you have to step uh, sequentially, make those observations, and then step through the line. And that way you build up um, a, uh, the, the full five dimensional, uh, four dimensions, and then you, you repeat it for the fifth dimension in time. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> well, a lot of people were, were very, um, at the time, people were very much um, pushing towards imaging instruments. But we realized, as I mentioned earlier, that the uh, impetus, um, the, the, the real analysis demanded that you have high integrity of your actual spectral profiles. And so we more or less insisted that the primary part of the instrument be a spectrographic instrument. And so uh, we were able to push that through. The, the Stokes Consortium, uh, essentially people with, were able to develop a, uh, the actual facility. We didn't have money for a, a new facility. So we had to go with something that, that existed. And uh, the, the best option we saw was the uh, Sac Peak Vacuum Tower Telescope. Um, and it boiled down to a, um, um, a real collaboration between Sacramento Peak Observatory and HAO. Um, and during the middle of development of this instrument, um, there essentially was a funding crisis. And it was in pretty tough times for, for the High Altitude Observatory financially. Peter Gilman was the, um, was the HAO director at that time. And he, I, I credit him with, with really uh, making this whole thing possible because uh, he made some very tough choices to be able to um, be able to uh, adequately fund the advanced Stokes polarimetry, and so if he hadn't done that, you know, I probably I probably wouldn't be here today. Um, 
talking to you. So I, uh, I think all of us um, need to recognize that, that behind the scenes contribution that, that, that Peter made. And I'm extremely um, thankful to him for that. This is the aerial view that you've seen of the Sacramento Peak Observatory now in a so sunspot and soon to be not in this old sunspot <laughs> when, when uh, the, the, the dekist is done. This is the, the Sac Peak uh, Tower Telescope, vacuum tower, tower telescope, which has been renamed since then as the Richard B. Dunn Solar Telescope. And this uh, slide lists a few of the um, innovations of the advanced Stokes polarimeter. Um, it was uh, th there were a lot of aspects that were, were really uh, very, um, very new to the field of solar polarimetry at that time. Uh, through uh, efforts and, and dedication of the instrumentation staff here at HAO. Uh, not the least of which was the um, implementation of high speed cameras running at 60 hertz uh, to do the spectral polarimetry, to do the actual polarimetry. Um, there are a number of issues, and I, I can't go through all the details here. And it's a complicated optical system. We had to do, have compromises um, because this is, is the telescope system here, all this, this part of it, of the, the diagram, um, of the optical diagram. It's evacuated, and it's, it's, it's got 130 some odd feet above ground and 200 and some odd feet below the ground. Um, and th there are two mirrors that, that constantly move to follow the sun. And this messes up your polarization, so it makes a difficult polarization calibration problem. Um, but but there were a lot, we went through a lot of, of issues to, to work on that. There's polarization calibration and optics. That's, uh, and and uh, indeed, um, we had imaging spectral polarimetry with a universal biorefringent filter, a Leo filter, um, uh, that that, uh, but uh, that was gave less than satisfactory uh, results in my own personal opinion. So we most of the concentration was on the spectrographic part here, and there are a lot of issues. I, I can't go through all of this either, uh, all the details, and I don't think you're probably very much interested in all the details anyway. But uh, the, there were, we actually observed not only at one wavelength, uh, two cameras for, for the iron lines that I've shown you, there are also two cameras for lines formed higher in the solar atmosphere, in the magnesium lines. The real architect behind the advanced Stokes polarimeter is David Elmore. He's the one who, who uh, uh, never ceased to amaze me in his his insight and his diligence and his understanding of the whole problem. Uh, here's a picture of a young David Elmore. And, uh, and, and the, I think he told me once there, this is some of the, of the complications that we had uh, uh, dealing with their multiple computers. I think there were like nine computers, most of them talking to each other. Um, many um, record, data recording devices, many displays and everything. Um, and uh, David was the lead engineer on this, and, and really, it's, it's heart and soul. Um, and it's to his credit and everybody else in the instrumentation group that it was deployed in, in late 1991, and, uh, and actually, uh, at that point, was ready for scientific observations. So um, I'm going to play a, a short video here of the party uh, that was had in the, in the basement of the Mesa lab where the instrumentation group was, was uh, held. This was a party in, uh, at the point of packing up the instrument. It had been put in a truck and was getting ready to be shipped down to, um, to Sac Peak. And These are the real party goers here. David Elmore was taking the, the video. There's Andy Skimanich. Yeah, um, there faces Linda Froom here and Paul Seagrave you saw. Um, Terry Leach did the electronics. Steve Tomchek, yes, we're all pigging out. There I am. Um, this is 24 years ago. Tim Strander, um, Jeff Schinke, and there's Greg. Um, there is a little sound, but you can't really really hear it. Um, everybody was very happy. Uh, there's Kim Strander again. And in a moment, you'll see Tom Pulser come in. 
yours truly. With uh, before I turn blonde. Well, the at the top, where would we be? There's Tom Holzer, the director at the time you know, of the uh, Paul Yeah, I know he was invited, but he couldn't make it. So yeah, that was a, a very happy time. So remember, Peter Gilman. A little nervous, but uh, as to what would, would happen, how it would work out. But. And uh, then down at Sac Peak, I, I um, um, happened to pull these videos off an old tape. There's Cam aligning the, the instrument. The instrument was spread out all over several optical tables. Um, uh, and up and down, attached to the telescope, the scheme, uh, all the video displays and everything. This, uh, this is all just very brief. We observed, we turned off all the lights to observe so we didn't have a lot of scattered light. And one thing that I should say is that, that the, the instrument was assembled and disassembled every time that we had an observing run, say four or five times a year. So um, that meant was made for another challenge. Well, let me go through here a few uh, of examples, a couple of ex short examples of the kind of science that came out of the advanced Stokes polarimeter. Um, again, involving uh, HAO people. This is not, um, of course, advanced Stokes polarimeter. This is, I believe, from EIT. This is ultraviolet uh, um, imaging in, in, the, in the corona. And, uh, and, and the point of this is that um, when uh, it's, it's now understood that uh, are, are believed that, that much of the, uh, that most coronal mass ejections are associated with uh, twisted magnetic fields. And so the point is, where does that uh, twist of the magnetic field come from? Um, and and the, the coronal mass, the, what you have in this case is an eruptive prominence, which is, is associated with the entire um, magnetic system that forms the coronal mass ejection, but it's an integral part of it. So we wanted to understand um, what the, uh, one of the objectives is, of course, understand where this, this twist comes from and, um, and, and what its effects are and what roles the, the prominence and the, the, the magnetic fields play in the stabilization and deep stabilization of the corona to form this mass ejection. Uh, and uh, we had one serendipitous uh, result that uh, of this little sunspot, it's known as a delta sunspot because it had opposite polarities within the same penumbra, next to a larger sunspot in some advanced Stokes polarimeter observations. This is the uh, continuum image, the white, uh, essentially visible light image of the sun. And then the next plane up is the vector magnetic field derived from those, uh, these observations from the advanced Stokes polarimeter mapping the, mapping the polarization across the, the image there. We also had H-alpha observations, Balmer hydrogen, which is formed in the chromosphere above. And you see a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, what's known as a filament, like a, a, prom it's a prominent scene against the disk, running down the center along the, the line that separates the two polarities, known as the inversion line. And the thing we noticed here, very importantly, is that, that the uh, configuration of the magnetic field was such that the fields point downwards and towards this, this um, polarity inversion line and upwards and away from it. In, order, in other words, the magnetic field is forming a concave structure in the photosphere. And we observed this uh, for several days and we saw that, that actually we believe a um, mass ejection came out of this system uh, a few, few days later. And, and so that, that cradling of the magnetic field is, is essentially an indicator of the presence of, of currents higher in the atmosphere that are causing the, the field to be essentially twisted. And uh, <coughs> Boon Chai, talk, I showed this to Boon Chai Low, and, and he immediately um, brought forward one of a, a model of a, essentially a, a self-contained uh, uh, toroidal topology of magnetic field that looked very much like what we did. This is, was, a, um, a, I believe, an analytic model of his. So I took that, that, that field, and, and with Paul Seagrave's help in, in visualizing it, we made this early visualization of, of uh, magnetic field lines of force. And, uh, and we considered that, that the, force, the, the fields 
in his model come up and, and make circuitous paths around uh, and, and up and then back down again. And those, and this, uh, those field lines, where particular field lines, the white ones, where they pass low down uh, towards the solar surface, they form a, a well where material can collect. And we believe that's where the, the filament material uh, occurs and is, is locked into the, but it's not uh, connected directly to the solar surface. It must go by a, a circuitous path. And when you actually look at this thing from above, as you've seen there, it looks very much like a filament. So, so we were, um, you know, this is the first time that, that, you know, we felt we had maybe an understanding that, that this twist was actually coming out from the solar interior and, uh, and forming, um, forming filaments and, and eruptions and, and later eruptions. Uh, we looked, uh, I looked a little bit farther and, and I found a few other examples of this in, in data here again as though it continued. Nothing much here in the middle. This is a, a active region with, with, um, with a filament running here and underneath that filament we again, I think you can see more clearly here, this concave structure down towards the polarity inversion line and back up. Um, so this was a very interesting to, to us and, and a, a, a nice observational um, uh, verification or um, um, realization. Uh, there are still questions. I mean, I'm not convinced that this is that the flux uh, always comes up twisted, and I'm, I'm convinced it does sometimes. But um, uh, later on, I'm going to show you that, that you know, uh, th there may be other ways in which the twist can be generated. Um, and, and other, they have been postulated, other ways that twists can be generated in situ in the corona. So there are ways to, to go after that. Um, there's a second um, topic of, uh, of the advanced Stokes polarimeter that I wanted to bring forward, and that is something really very unexpected. Um, one time I was looking through some data of the quiet, a map of a dead quiet sun. Here is the, the intensity map and the polarization IQ, U, and V spectra. And I noticed sitting here off, off by itself was this little symmetric feature indicating transverse fields that wasn't associated with any uh, um, uh, vertical fields or line of sight fields in Stokes V. And that was really curious. It was the first time we'd really seen this. And it was very small. And uh, I thought, wow, in this, this is interesting because the sensitivity of of the Zeeman effect to transverse fields, especially when they're weak, is very much smaller to, than, than for uh, the sensitivity of Stokes uh, V. So that meant that these fields had to be pretty strong. They're really small scale. And um, <coughs> um, the, uh, uh, we proceeded to make, take some data where we held the spectrograph slit fixed in one position and were able to determine the time evolution of some of these things. And we determined that they're, they're transient. They only last a few minutes. They're really small scale. They're sort of an arc second, uh, smaller than the size of one convection granule. And um, from what we could determine, we hop hypothesized them to be the emergence of very small loops into the solar atmosphere. Uh, and uh, But when you look at that and you sum up all over the whole uh, sphere of the sun, how much of this could be coming up. It turned out to be, if those were emerging loops, it turned out to be something like a thousand times more than the emergence rate of, of all the active regions of the solar cycle combined. So this was a um, uh, very surprising result and very interesting. Um, uh, then uh, all the time when we, of course, we always have um, a desire to improve our, our situation with terms of observations. And one, even though the, um, the ASP had higher resolution than many uh, magnetic, magnet, magnetic instruments, especially those that got the vector magnetic field, we wanted to go uh, even, do even better because we were frustrated because oftentimes the, the, the atmospheric effects uh, in the Earth's atmosphere prevented really high resolution imaging, especially since we had to integrate for uh, several seconds in order to build up the necessary signal to noise in the polarization. Um, so this is a, I would say, kind of a typical map of an active region under typical scene conditions. 
It's not the worst, but it's, it's certainly not the best, but it's, it's not the worst either. Uh, this is sort of, uh, at the same time, what one could do by imaging. And you can see the difference in the kind of resolution that you get. And we wanted to be able to start to see some of these high, high, small scale features and really understand what the structure, the kind of structures that Matthias was describing earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, so it's one thing to, to um, uh, make an image like that, and that's an instantaneous image of a hundredth of a second or less, where you freeze the atmospheric motions, and, and yet another thing to do precision polarimetry. And furthermore, uh, when we make observations, we don't have very good conditions for, for very much time at SAC peak, and then you have to quit for the day. There are clouds. Uh, you only, we only can set up uh, the observation four or five times a year and because it was a, a community facility. So uh, a space mission was the, it was the dream at that time. And, and so for, uh, again, I, I lucked out in that uh, um, we had a visit from, uh, at HAO from uh, Professor Suneda of the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan and had a chance to talk to him. Valentin martinez Pilet was a, a postdoc at, at HAO at the time. And he reminded me this morning that, that he was with me in the office when Suneda made that visit. I think it was in about 1994, uh, three years after deployment of the SP. We had the, this dream of doing a space experiment, but uh, he became very interested in what we were doing. He was the, the principal um, behind the Yoko, highly successful Japanese Yoko mission that did X-ray imaging of the sun. Um, that led to the development of the Hinode spacecraft in which we had, uh, HAO had a collaboration with Lockheed to build a focal plane package for uh, this uh, large solar telescope. Um, and that was the NASA one of the NASA contributions to this mission. Uh, uh, the J Japan contributed the, the telescope itself and the, the launch vehicle and, and the spacecraft. And there were other instruments from, um, from uh, uh, ultraviolet spectroscopy from uh, the UK and, and a combination of NASA and Japan for an X-ray telescope. Um, that, this uh, Hinode mission is still flying and giving great data today, nine years after launch. Um, we, uh, with, we worked jointly, as I mentioned, with Lockheed Martin uh, to develop, uh, especially the spectrophorometer part here at HAO, but with them also narrowband filter imaging. And this is an optical diagram. It's a little dim, but uh, the, the real point is here's a, this, this very largest, still the largest solar telescope in space, 50 centimeter diameter. And, and from the outset, this whole system was designed for polarimetry immediately after the telescope. The first element is a polarization modulator. Um, um, and uh, this, is, this shows it. It isn't scattered over hu many huge uh, optical tables, uh, th four or five meters. Uh, this is the whole in instrument package is, I think, described as a, as a child's mattress size, you know, a meter and a half by roughly a meter and, and say, this, this thick. Um, complicated system, but, but simple in the, in the fact that it's, it has to be for space. Um, I'm going to give an example of, of Hinode um, science as well, and uh, I've taken from yesterday, this is the Solar Dynamics Observatory continuum image of the sun, showing you uh, how active the sun is today. They're just, I don't know, we, you, some of you might have seen it today. I don't know if these regions have developed, but there's a tiny region there and a few tiny sunspots there. I did this image just to, uh, to show you what the size of the map that I'm going to show next is on the sun from the Hinode spectropolarimeter. This is the map. Um, it's 2,000 pixels in this direction and 1,000 in this direction, so 2 million pixels total. And I remind you that each of those pixels has a full Stokes spectra of the iron lines with about 10 to the minus 3 um, 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 polarimetric accuracy. So 
has an incredible wealth of information. You can see all the granulation here in, in, in detail. And I'm going to zoom in on a small portion. Oh, no, next I'm just going to show this. And remember the, the small scale horizontal uh, features we, we discovered with, with, um, with uh, the advanced Stokes polarimeter? Well, they came roaring out. And so they're everywhere on, on, on the quiet sun. You have these horizontal features. Dark here means higher polarization or the presence of, of horizontal features. Zooming into that a little bit closer, uh, you can see the noise level here, but you definitely see these features are real, even though some people are still sort of claiming that when we look at this, we, we, we're, we're, we're seeing mostly noise. But, but these features are very real. This is the line of sight field, the salt and pepper of, of the opposite polarities of the line of sight field. Um, so these are a real, it enabled us for the, really for the first time to explore the, the relationship of these horizontal features, which are in blue, to the granulation, and also um, uh, the relationship uh, to the line of sight fields. And you can see that they're in general, they're not, not uh, directly associated even uh, to the um, line of sight fields, which are, are red, and, red and green, excuse me, green. Uh, with the strongest ones with yellow contours. So, so uh, uh, there are a number of aspects we were able to really start to understand this feature. Rebecca Centeno did a very nice um, study in detail of here. This is a, just a few granules. And w with uh, repeated short maps with the spectral polarimeter, we were able to map this region and, and make time series. And we're able to catch these events as they were um, were born. You see the yellow contours are horizontal. The red and green are, are vertical components of opposite polarity. And you can see how those show, come up just like the foot points of this loop. So the so the loop, there's a little loop here with, with foot points, the vertical field, and horizontal in between that rises up. And this is at the center of a granule. They spread out. The vertical fields spread there. And, and subsequently, we know from further analyses of of later data that, that those kind of loops then, uh, the horizontal fields then go higher into the atmosphere and make and, and have an impact in a little higher in the atmosphere. <clears throat> These are not really strong fields compared to many of the, in the even in the quiet sun, you have fields over a thousand gauss in, in, in many places in the sun. But they're, but, uh, and, and so they, they probably are not uh, terribly buoyant. Um, um, from their magnetism, and they're probably being carried up by the convection of the granulation itself. Um, so, but what we did find is that, that we know there are emerging loops. What we did find is that there's a lot more flux, at least at the level where we're measuring, in horizontal than in vertical. And um, <clears throat> this was an, another um, uh, aspect of, of that, of understanding this quiet sun magnetism. Well, I want to continue on with this a little bit more. And you've seen the magnetic butterfly diagram earlier today. And, and you wonder whether all this, this really quiet sun observations that we're seeing, all the, the, the flux, whether it's, it's caused by, it's, 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 it's inst instigated by these, these uh, features in the magnetic field that either are directly from the sunspots or their, their manifestation as part of the global solar cycle. And um, there have been several studies um, of Hinode data for this. Um, and, and all of these studies so far really indicate, since Hinode has the spatial resolution, we can actually separate those strong field, um, uh, re, uh, field. It turns out that all this, this, this you see uh, in terms of the magnetic fields from the solar cycle, they, they are pretty much all harbored in the stronger fields, the kilogauss flux elements. But with Hanoli, we can separate those out and just look at the very quiet fields. And what we find is that, in, indeed, in several studies, one I did uh, early on in, in, in covering these, this la these solar latitudes in this time, Bueller et al. studied near the, 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 uh, the solar equator, uh, this sort of region, and then uh, finally, uh, I did a study of, of this re of, of all of observations spanning this whole range of latitude and time. 
um, <clears throat> to look for any signatures of, of the um, solar cycle, of the global solar cycle, and we essentially didn't, didn't find any. This is, if you look, um, this is the, the, the longitudinal fields from pole to pole and as a function of time. This is about four years here. Um, and, uh, and we see the solar cycle here in, the, in, in, integrate in all of the magnetic flux, but when we isolate out and throw away the, the, just the stronger fields, representing a small fraction of the area, we don't see any signature, the perceptible signature of the solar cycle in those. So I think this is another nail uh, in the coffin. Not you can't really of of, of leaning towards this presence of a of a small scale solar dynamo that's acting independently of the um, of the global solar dynamo that Mateus uh, mentioned earlier today. And and these are the kind of these data were are, are a program set up actually by Tom Berger and I. Uh, it's called the Irradiance Program. Tom's here today, um, where monthly he only makes measurements from pole to pole of the of of the um, magnetic field using the spectropolarimeter, and also with the other uh, imaging instrument. And the imaging instrument does it equator to equator. So we have this wonderful database that we hope to continue throughout the as long as he is able to operate. I'd like to uh, mention, um, uh, just uh, head on towards uh, uh, talking about HAO's contributions. Uh, HAO has, was a, a, a significant player in the helioseismic and magnetic imager on the Solar Dynamics Observatory uh, that's been in operation for five years now almost. Uh, <coughs> this um, satellite, um, this, this experiment, um, is a filter-based instrument, but the advantage is that, it, and it doesn't do things quite as well as the spectrophorometer on Hinode, but it gets the entire sun and it gets it all the time. And so there's a tremendous opportunity for studying evolution of many features with that. And in summary of all these instruments as far as spectrophorometry, I think that as a result of, of all this and the efforts of all these people at HAO, over the years and the decades, that now um, spectropolarimetry has become a mainstay of observational solar physics. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, these, these, the advanced Stokes polarimeter was, and the Hinode and the SDO magnetic imager continued to be fit facilities that are available to the entire international community. And uh, HEO continues to maintain the Hinode database under the uh, guise of the NCAR CSAC program. And that's available and serves data to the entire community. <clears throat> and prepares and conditions the data as well, I should, should say. Well, I'm, I was asked to say a little bit about my present and planned research. And uh, basically what I want to uh, just mention is that I'm still interested in these very weak fields. And now, but um, from the standpoint of taking these wonderful simulations from Matthias Rimpel, which are uh, not the sunspot, but the quiet sun, which are these local dynamo simulations where the fields come up um, essentially from a minuscule seed field, and, and, and see if I can understand some effects of the, uh, I've noticed in these um, uh, irradiance data uh, in terms of the cent center to limb behavior. And I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but what I notice is if we, we, when we throw out the, uh, the, the, the stronger fields and just look at the, what we call the internetwork fields, we see that the, um, the uh, amount of flux that we see decreases from the disk center towards the limb in this, this way. But if I take just the very weakest flux that's still above the noise, and look at that, it increases towards the limb. And this is not a, so, uh, an effect of north to south uh, la because uh, there are various reasons why I think, I think this is essentially just a center limb effect. And I made some postulates as to why that could be, but actually with the uh, simulation data, you know what's in them, you know what it is. And so we are looking in those data to see if I can understand what the source of this is. So that's an ongoing going subject. Um, 
it's interesting to know what the, what the fields, quote, really look like. This is what we, we measured with Hinode, the slide I showed previously where the stronger fields were darker uh, in the horizontal fields. In the simulations, this is what they look like. And you can see there's a wealth of detail that we're, we're basically uh, missing even with Hinode. So we're not resolving it. And in fact, we probably never will resolve all these fields because of limitations of scattering in the, in the uh, solar atmosphere. Um, but it's, in, Mateus, and please correct me if I I'm, misquote I'm you on this, but he said that, that the, the, in these simulations that the amount of magnetic flux in the solar convection zone on these, from these local dynamo simulations is some uh, orders of magnitude greater than the flux that's uh, present in the larger scale dynamo. And so that it may, brings up the question whether these have any implications, these fields have any implications for the global structure of the star itself. I mean, the magnetic energy is, could be significant uh, and, and change the structure. Um, and then I just wanted to finally say I'd like to use the uh, HMI data, the, uh, the, the uh, solar dynamics uh, data, vector magnetic fields, to study these uh, active region filaments in detail. And I believe um, uh, that's, just, that's just showing the uh, uh, results of, of inversion of the HMI data. It does a pretty nice job in active regions. Although it doesn't do well in the quiet sun, it does a nice job in active regions. Very nice maps of the vector magnetic field. And so we're going to look at the evolution of, of, of as many active regions as we can, look at the filaments, and see what we can determine about that using this instrument. Um, finally, uh, uh, I think the future lies in understanding what the of magnetic field measurement lies not in the photosphere, but understanding what the magnetic fields are doing above the photosphere in the chromosphere, where essentially all the action goes on in terms of flares and coronal max, mass ejections and the energetics are of, of, uh, of the energetic uh, ultraviolet um, uh, emissions of the of the uh, sun that uh, are, have significant terrestrial impacts. Um, I'm going to leave you with, uh, I just want to skip over that. I'm going to leave you with, uh, as many of you know, I'm living now much of the time in Costa Rica. We have a farm there. And I'm going to show a few images from the farm uh, to conclude here. Uh, this is our farm. is called Finca Lilo. And, uh, so um, when you retire, I guess you're essentially put out to pasture. Here I am going out to pasture. Uh, but actually, you know, I'm not too worried about that. I don't let it get my goat. Um, in fact, you know, I guess one of the, I don't know what the requirements are for a distinguished scholar, but uh, I guess you're supposed to be outstanding in your field. So. So here I am, outstanding in my field. And I'm not kidding about this. <laughs> Actually, you know, I'm really enjoying my, my retirement very much down there when I'm down there. Um, I'm enjoying it swimmingly. Here I am. And, and uh, I, all of this, I see everybody graying here that I haven't seen in years. They're graying and, and so forth. Uh, and, but those of you who are still young in the audience, and many of you are from HAO, you can look forward to your, uh, you too can look forward to your retirement. <laughs> There's another toucan, another variety. And you can enjoy your morning coffee, which we grow on the farm. And occasionally you can collaborate with colleagues. This is Javier Trujillo Bueno from the uh, uh, Instituto de Astrophysica, Astrophysica de Canarias in the and uh, he would visit the farm after a conference that we put on. <coughs> and so um, I'll just leave you with that. And this is an image from down by the river. And uh, I, a, just a, a, a thanks to, to everyone at HAO INCAR and UCAR for, for their incredible support. I've been extraordinarily fortunate over the years. And this, here's I just list a few of the HAO people who been especially in, in influential to my, my career. Thank you very much.
I had the great pleasure of having Bruce as a supervisor for four years, so um, I can speak firsthand to his diligence and real expertise. Now, we have a reception outside, but I have room for one question. Who wants to pose a question? Oh, there's one in the back. It's, of course, Maestro. Valentin. So just, just to confirm that Suneta San came to HAO in October 94, and at this meeting he was convinced he wanted to fly something like the ASP in Hinode, and I had the pleasure to be there. Uh, so that's the comment, but I have a question which is on this uh, dual beam polarimetry. Can you tell us how you came up with this concept? Because I think ASP was the first one using that, and I think that was fundamental to the success of ASP, this, this dual beam concept. I never really oh, asked you. About well, it. I think that the, that sort of thing had been uh, been in use in other circumstances, a dual beam, but it was a combination of dual beam and fast time modulation. Now, people had done beam switching things, and they did it slow, uh, slowly. But but there was a, a fast time, and uh, you know, maybe David has an answer. Is to, to, is David here? <laughs> Okay. I can ask him. I know where he lives. Yeah. I know where he works. So no problem there. <laughs> so, well, and I plan to go to your uh, I, I hope you can soon. make it sometime. Thank you. And so uh, thanks, Bruce, again. For, uh, Thank you. A great presentation and a storied career.